to start. Uh, my name is Julie Wong. I want to welcome you to our Advances in Dementia Research Series webinars, webinar series. And these are presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto in partnership with the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance. This series discusses recent updates in dementia research and highlights dementia research studies occurring across Toronto. Today, our speaker is Dr. Sandra Black, who will be talking about um, understanding the complexities of aging and dementia. And she will also be sharing with you the BEAM study. Um, a, a little bit of housekeeping. So we are recording these sessions. The, the recording will be available on the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto's YouTube channel, as well as the TDRA website. Uh, it will appear a few days. As we're going through the presentation, I do ask that you keep yourselves on mute. And if you do have questions, you can feel free to enter them into the chat box. I will be monitoring them and there will be all, some opportunity for you to unmute after the presentation to speak and ask Dr. Sandra Black. A little bit about the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. We are we provide free education, counseling, and programming and information to persons who are living with dementia, their care partners, so family and friends. We also do training for healthcare professionals as well as general awareness for general public. A couple things that I do want to stress is that even though we do we are called the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, we service all dementia. So whether you are living with Lewy body or you are questioning, we will service everyone. Um, some other things to be mindful of is you do not need to have a diagnosis in order to access this, our services. Anyone who has questions or uh, is suspecting can also access our services and anyone can do a referral. The only caveat is if you are referring a friend or a client, you do need to have the consent of whoever you're referring for our services. Other than that, anyone can refer. In order to refer, you can actually fill out the online referral form, which is listed here, www.alz.to slash referral. All of our programs are being provided in multiple formats. So there are face-to-face -face services, there are Zoom services, and we also offer education on the education platform www.alzeducate.ca. To use this particular platform, you will need to sign in for an account. I'd like to now introduce our partner, the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance, short form TDRA. Established in 2012, the TDRA is a collaboration amongst the, the University of Toronto and affiliated academic hospitals, including Baycrest, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, Ontario Shore Centre for Mental Health Sciences, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre, Unity Health, and the University Health Network. TDRA is working together to better understand, prevent, and treat dementia by creating a stronger link between basic science and clinical research, embedding research into care, improving outreach and education to the community, and increasing the efficiency of collaborative research processes across the city. I'd like to now hand things off to my partner at the TDRA, Natalie, to speak with you a little bit more. Great, hello everyone. So my name is Natalie. I'm a research coordinator with the TDRA. Julie, if we could just move to the next slide. I'm gonna just introduce an initiative that AST and TDRA partnered on, which is the Toronto Dementia Network. It's a website that lists um, dementia-related programs and services across Toronto. And on this website, we created a section called Research Studies, which lists dementia studies that are open for participation across the city. So each study there is led by TDRA affiliated scientists and has been approved by a research ethics board. There are studies for people with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, mild cognitive impairment, those at risk of developing dementia and healthy volunteers and caregivers. All the studies are summarized in plain language. If you want to check it out, the website is listed there in orange and information about the TDN can also be found on both the AST and TDRA websites. Can go to the next slide. 
And when you're on the website, there are two main pathways. First, um, you can browse for a study using search terms, filters, and quick searches. When you find a study that you're interested in, you can fill out a contact form and you'll be connected with the research team who will enroll you in the study if it's something you might be eligible for. Or at the bottom here, if you're not sure where to start, you can fill out a questionnaire to be matched to a study. And any information you enter anywhere on the website will be securely stored and protected. Next slide. Great, and this is what the website actually looks like. When you're on the page, if you're looking for something specific, for example, Alzheimer's disease studies, you can type it in the search bar along the top. You can either hit submit with that term or apply more filters like the type of study or the target population or location. Alternatively, you can use the quick search boxes we have, um, which are in blue on the screen. If you'd rather fill out a questionnaire to be matched to a study, you can click match me to a study in the quick search box or scroll to the bottom of the page and you'll see an orange button that says can't find a study you're interested in and that will also take you to the questionnaire. Each study summary, as shown in the BEAM study example on the left, describes what the study is about, who can participate, the location, and the time requirement. Again, it's all in plain language. And BEAM is the study being discussed today. So you go ahead and check out the listing after the webinar if it's something you're interested in participating in or in learning more. Next slide. Okay, and I'd like to now introduce our speaker for today. We're grateful to be joined by Dr. Sandra Black. Dr. Black is an internationally renowned cognitive neurologist who has been actively engaged in clinical trials for over 30 years. She's a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and served as TDRA's executive director from 2012 to 2020. In 2020, she became scientific director of the Dr. Sandra Black Center for Brain Resilience and Recovery at Sunnybrook. Her research uses standardized comprehensive neuroimaging, clinical measures, genetics, and neuropathology to study brain behavior relationships in dementia. So welcome, Dr. Black, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Can you see the... Perfect, yes. Whoa, well, uh, <laughs> don't ask me. All right. Um, so I guess understanding the complexity of aging and dementia also reflects the complexity of trying to use the internet and Zoom, um, and I don't know why... It uh, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So I'm going to quickly um, talk to you about the complexity of aging and dementia. And the study is reflecting um, a recognition of that because we're doing some biomarker or PET imaging in conditions like Lewy body disease, Parkinson's disease, and small vessel disease, in addition to patients who have the more conventional like Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, which is where most of the effort has been in application of these new biomarkers. So I do, um, I'm involved in many pharma clinical trials. It's very active right now in the field. I've done a little lecturing for Biogen and I'm an ad hoc consultant to Roche and Biogen. They're, I'm not gonna be talking about clinical trials per se, it's biomarkers. So what I'm talking about isn't so affected by what these companies are doing, although we're very active in the trials. And I mentioned here my grant funding and some salary support. I have no stock or equity interests. So um, I'm gonna to try to make it clear that there's comorbid, both vascular, which means things that have to do with blood vessels and neurodegenerative, which means the neurons are degenerating, the nerve cells and their various uh, uh, family members are degenerating. And the point is that having those core occur together, both neurodegenerative and vascular disease is the rule, not the exception in the common dementias. I'm gonna to try to illustrate this <clears throat> by showing on MRI, some of the visible markers we have of stroke and small vessel disease, for example. And then we're also now able to see what are called misfolded proteins. You know them as plaque and tangles in the case of Alzheimer's disease. And in the plaque is a protein that you know is called amyloid a beta discovered in the 1980s and tau entangles discovered in the 1990s with it being described first by uh, Alzheimer in 1906. So it took almost 100 years for us to be able to identify the proteins that were involved and uh, now we are not just identifying them 
on uh, PET scans, uh, which shows the distribution of the abnormality, but also in the blood as well as the CSF. So what I'm going to try to do is highlight just briefly these blood-based biomarkers where you can measure some of these proteins in the blood, genetics, which tells you if a person is predisposed to disease, uh, uh, as well as you know uh, the development of disease-modifying therapies that might be just around the bend, and how we're using sort of brain imaging analysis and machine learning to go toward what we call precision medicine. Precision medicine is that you're targeting what you think is relevant to the disease. This is still a matter of question with respect to amyloid and tau, except they're probably not good to have in your brain, but there are some people in their 80s who may have amyloid in the brain and they're still cognitively normal, which is really interesting. Um, and so we're still trying to test this hypothesis that having these plaques and tangles in a way that we can measure when you're alive and not just at autopsy, which is what Alzheimer's is doing, might allow us to do um, both treatments to reduce the progression to more dependent states or even prevention, which means if you're still normal, but you've got the biomarker, there are studies already starting to try to prevent you declining. So this is mostly in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And now we'll move on to just not re I have to remind everybody how important this is. The recent update suggesting that, you know, we're close to, well, 78 million in a few more years. It's um, already $1.3 trillion worldwide to deal with uh, dementia. And uh, every three seconds, somebody, you know, a diagnosis is made. I also want to emphasize that there are a lot of lifestyle and important public health measures that are extremely important in, you know, the risk factors for developing older age dementia. There's some genetic forms that can happen because of the mutation, but, and they start, people start to get sick in their twenties, but we're talking about the later onset. So education is very important. This is a recent uh, publication that was, you know, highlighting a whole bunch of factors. And one of the ones that came out new because we're getting better at treating diabetes and hypertension as some of the vascular factors was hearing loss. So subclinical hearing loss, even just mild hearing loss is now recognized as a risk factor for later life dementia. And it's very important to recognize and treat. We know that traumatic brain injury can, can contribute, high blood pressure can, uh, alcohol also, but alcohol now is a risk factor for cancer, which has just become available as knowledge, new knowledge. Obesity, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical act activity, very important to be walking every day if you can. Pollution and diabetes are all potentially modifiable. So some of them are not modifiable, but this is just a reminder that our lifestyle choices are very, very important. Actually, restorative sleep is also very important. So biomarkers are molecular you know, molecular signals um, that uh, tell us, you know, what's going on in the brain. There might be genetics, there might be biochemical abnormalities, some at birth, or life. And, you know, we're moving towards the ability to identify these various so-called biomarkers. Um, they've advanced very quickly in cancer and cardiovascular disorders, and they're really starting to emerge in the dementias. They can be useful for diagnosis, identifying therapeutic targets, and then monitoring patterns of progression and also response to therapies. The challenge in our field is there's a complex mix of causes for the common dementias that involve these misfolded proteins, as they're called, that's the tau and the amyloid, and then vascular pathologies, which I'm going to show you in a moment. In a moment. And these are now becoming more available to us because of the imaging advances and also blood-based biomarkers. I'll just show how complex this is. This is showing the omics, what they call all the different areas of science that have to do with molecular networks. It's just to kind of humble us all when we think we know what we're doing. When you see how many different, you know, areas of focus you can have, like brain structure and function is what I've been sort of interested in, but there's um, metabolomics and proteomics. We all have to be interested for Alzheimer's disease now. There's genomics. The exposome is what's your, you know, pollution and what's going on in your life. This is just to remind us that we're we're in very, very complex territory, and it should not be surprising that what we see often is mixes of things as opposed to something very pure. And this is demonstrated in some studies where people are followed to their postmortem, to uh, autopsy, brain don through brain donation. And I just want you to look at the right side where you can see people who were diagnosed as having probable Alzheimer's disease, meaning that was their best guess that this person had Alzheimer's disease, they had memory problems, some language and navigation problems, they fit the bill. 
And at autopsy, less than 10% of those patients only had Alzheimer's pathology, the plaque and tie, tangles. Where you see V, V means vascular pathology. It could be hardening of the arteries. I'm going to talk a bit about hardening of the veins. It could be a larger artery uh, uh, problems. But basically, vascular contributions are huge. And then other dementias, other degenerative diseases are also there. And you can see that the V is the most prevalent. And the O refers to other dimensions like Lewy body disease can coexist with Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's can coexist with Alzheimer's disease. And so we know from even when you have the diagnosis that much of this is going on. And when you look at the normal controls in MCI, V is actually the biggest. So vascular pathology is hugely important and it often coexists with uh, the pathologies of concern. And there is a way of also looking at this even in Alzheimer's disease. And this was a, just kind of an overview we, we published a few years ago just to help people get their head around it, showing that if you go along the horizontal axis, early onset, late onset, um, those are, these have some different characteristics. Early onset patients often have a kind of, a, it's called posterior cortical atrophy. They have a sort of an unusual presentation where the back part of the brain is much more affected than the memory area, for example. Um, then you can have the copathologies with like Lewy body disease, this is the vertical axis, or these white matter hypotensives, I'm going to show you those in a moment. And then you have just, and they have the genetic factor, your APOE4 is a risk factor. Um, so you're more likely to get Alzheimer's disease if you have one of those genes from a parent, you're going to have three times the risk of developing later onset Alzheimer's. If you have one from each parent, you're going to have 13 times risk. So this is also very, very important to know. And then there are various variants. It's called logopenic variant, the LVAD, where you have language predominant problems, frontal variant, frontal behavior problems, um, and um, uh, you know, and then sort of age of onset. The younger you are, um, the often the more uh, the more sort of aggressive the disease. But especially in the people who have mutations, where they're called autosomal dominant disease, and there people are sick in the 20s, and they're usually dead by their 50s. So that's a really um, difficult area to target because they're over making, they're making too much amyloid from birth. So let's quickly look at the imaging. This is what Alice Homer was describing in his original, um, his original paper. Down in the left, you can see the plaques and then there's the tangles. You can see the shrunken brain and there was a distribution to it. It wasn't the whole brain. There were certain parts of the brain. They're called the association areas. The sensory motor areas and other like primary sensory areas are sort of spared. And these are um, these are the proteins that now we've been able to identify, the tangles and the plaques. I'm not going to spend time on this because we have, we're running out of time. But um, it, the, the, truth, the truth is that we can now look at this in the brain. And here's show, this is showing all the ways that you can look at the brain with uh, imaging techniques that are currently available. Amyloid is still not so easily available in, in, in Canada. Uh, FDG PET, that's a glucose PET um, which has been around since the 19, early 80s, um, isn't available in all provinces. It's not in Ontario. It's not paid for in Ontario. But we can still, uh, we're going to, we're using them in, as part of research studies. And amyloid PET is what we're doing in the BEAM study, for example. Structural MRI, we can do. And actually, if you do it properly, and now we've got everybody doing a standard, standard MRI scan in the TDRA. So that means you can do all sorts of measurements together and add great numbers. When TDRA works together, we see about 2,000 new patients a year. If people agree and they, they allow us to link their, their standard assessments we do and their MRI scans, then you start to get some real um, power in being able to contribute to the world understanding with 2,000 patients a year. In five years, you've got 10,000 patients, well-studied, and they can be linked to health services research, which can have an enormous impact. The other ones, diffusion and resting state are nice to have, but they're not standard. They, one measures um, the integrity of the, of the connections, the white matter of the brain, and the other measures the functional connections. They're very, very important for understanding what's affected in Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that there's certain areas that are more than others, but it doesn't, it's not red as a typical scan right now, which you get is mostly a structural MRI where you can get knowledge of kind of structural shrinkage um, and uh, these uh, white matter changes. So the idea is that these biomarkers that build up in Alzheimer's disease have uh, different trajectories. 
So the amyloid plaques start first and they almost kind of plateau. The neurofibrillary tangles start to take off. And when those um, are doing enough damage, then you start to get shrinkage of the neurons in the brain itself. And so there's a kind of a pattern of all this, of which we're mostly focusing on some of the proteins. Inflammation is very important. And there are other you know, aspects that we don't fully understand. And we have been able to measure spinal fluid um, tau and amylate for a number of years, but the advantage now is you can do it in the blood. Our group has developed a, a very um, kind of personalized uh, pipeline that allows you to have all these measures, including a stroke, so that you can uh, account for the stroke and still get information about the rest of the brain's volumes. I won't go into details about this, but um, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that we've kind of contributed to the literature and it allows us to have a personalized pipeline, even if you have a head injury or a stroke or something that's caused structural damage that misses, messes up some of the other automatic machine learning processes in other, that have been developed in other sites. So this is a cortical signature that you see in Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's shown here the areas that are mostly affected. And it looks again, sort of like what else was showing or what he was finding. But when you look at the most significant um, areas of what they call the signature areas are shown here on the right. This is where there's cortical thinning. You can actually see that the brain is shrinking in those areas and as well in the, what we call the hippocampus. And I'll show you some more of that in a moment. So this is the hippocampus. It's deep in the brain here. This is a shrunken hippocampus. And we've now got ways of, of tra through careful tracing of isolating it and turning it into something that we can generate um, in a matter of 90 seconds, when you use machine learning applied to data sets we've collected through the Sunnybrook Dementia Study and other data sets that are around the world available. And in the other parts of this, you can see the ventricle, that's the black areas deep in the brain where the spinal fluid is produced. And in the ventricles, um, you, we can also measure the size of the ventricles, which reflects injury to the brain. And we can give you the total brain parenchyma, which is what's uh, left of the rest of it, what the actual brain is, what's left of it. And I'll show you now quickly some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, white matter disease. So this is just a cute side note that hippocampus, which is where all the short-term memory storage is and where you're gathering information, what is personal to you in space and time, this is what it looks like when you take it out. And when they first decided to start doing brain dissections back in the 15th and 16th century, they noticed it looked like a seahorse. So it's called the hippocampus. And there are other parts of the brain that have names based on what they look like from the neuroanatomists uh, many hundred years ago. So small vessel disease is very, very important because we don't just have neurons. We have what we call the neuroglial vascular unit. And that includes the neuron, yes, but you have, you've got to feed the neuron. So that's what the endothelium does in the, um, that's in the blood vessels in the middle shown there. And it secretes, they secrete various things. And by the way, COVID goes through something called the angiotensin convincing angiotensin con converting enzyme on all vasculature, which is why it's such a, it's such a challenge for um, our, our, our world right now because it can get in almost anywhere in the brain. Smooth muscle around the, bench, uh, around the arterial helps to open and close the vessel according to the need of the blood flow that you have. The astrocytes are like the sort of, you know, the protective factor. They, they keep the blood brain barrier closed. And then there are, and they're sort of like, you know, they're the helper cells that protect the neurons. And the perivascular cells are called, uh, microglia cells are very important for chewing up uh, toxic amyloid. And so they're, they play a very important role in getting rid of amyloid when you're actually giving treatments. So, the whole idea here is it's not just the neuron and the axons which are running from them. It's the whole family that has to be healthy and all plays a role in trying to understand why mixed disease is so important and why vessels are also very important. Here's an example of the brain's vascular network. When I saw this, it's online actually, uh, it's just extraordinary. And some of my basic science colleagues tell me, make calculations that the, the number of the, that's just, like 500 miles of vasculature in the human brain. So how could you imagine that you could ignore that when you're trying to understand you know, neurodegenerative diseases? And here's uh, now what's been happening. There are ways of defining these diseases. So um, you can have white matter hypertensity shown here, like little fluffy white stuff. If, if there's a hole, that's called a lacoon. 
to something called perivascular spaces, which um, I'll show you in a moment. The microbleeds and they're also micro infarcts. We're just going to we're just going to talk about a couple of them. So the perivascular spaces are where um, amyloid and other garbage um, gets uh, gets flowed along to get out of the brain, especially during deep sleep. That's why you need deep sleep. And um, those are actually normal phenomena, but sometimes they're enlarged in certain conditions. And uh, our pipeline, you know, allowed us, uh, unlike many others, to see these uh, see these perivascular spaces and uh, showed even that the enlargement of them is associated with uh, sleep disturbances in people after stroke, for example. The um, gradient echo MRI scan, which is now standard, shows these microbeads. And this is an example of a person who had a hemorrhage uh, in the brain. And you can see the black area at the back here and some white stuff. But the black stuff is where the person had iron deposits because when you bleed, the hemoglobin of iron becomes hemosiderin. It gets, picks, it gets picked up in an MRI as black because iron shows up as black in the magnetic field. So that's what these microbleeds are. And these are important because if you have too many of those in your brain to start with, and about 30% of people with Alzheimer's disease will have some microbleeds and about 10% of normal elders will have it. But if in the clinical trials for the antibody removing therapies, you can't have more than five of these because you then will be ineligible because there's a risk that the, the, the increasing exiting of the amyloid along the vessels um, may contribute to microbleeds and what they call mesogenic edema. This is the periventricular white matter disease, which is very, very important. It's very common as people age, showing different degrees of it. It's something that we've um, studied a lot. And it shows you from five, what, five cubic centimeters distributed in the brain looks like up to 50. Um, and we, uh, you know, we now can, you know, do this, we quantify this, and so you can uh, see exactly where it is, and we can show what it looks like in 3D. But more important, we've, ha we've helped to understand what underlies it. And what underlies it is shown here when you co-locate, you see the co-location of that periventricular white matter disease with a deep penetrating venular system. And that was sort of a unique contribution that our lab has made to the world understanding of this because actually what you're seeing is hardening of the veins shown here. Um, you can see there's thickening here and you, um, you have to do a special stain to see it. And that's what causes leakage along, uh, along those perivascular pathways, the deep penetrating vessels, the venular system, and also we can in injure the white matter as well. This can lead um, to problems that shows up in what is it called amyloid imaging abnormalities, which are very important. It can happen spontaneously, but also it's, uh, we see it in the clinical trials. I'll just show you what it looks like. So here is somebody who was in a clinical trial. They had this edema. And when you have that and you're getting antibodies, they have to pause it. Sometimes it goes away. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it leaves microbes in its wake. Um, but that's something that is, uh, has to be followed and can be associated with symptoms confusion, seizures, and occasionally can lead to a cerebral hemorrhage, a few of which have been lethal, people have died. So that's why you really have to be careful about what you're doing in these studies. Now, there's very complicated um, kind of pathways, and I just, I'm just showing this not because you understand it, but what's important is the what are called the oligomers. I'm just gonna do the further thing. The oligomers, they become fibrils and eventually they become plaque, right? That's just sort of for you to know. And what we can do now is we can measure some of these, um, these biomarkers in the blood. But more importantly, the different antibodies are targeting the oligomeric, the fibrillar and plaque proteins, and that's how they're removing amyloid. So the important thing is when should you be giving this antibody treatment? We know that plaques are developing anywhere from seven to 20 years before you, you're aware of it. And so the idea would be early stage is better. And that's what's going on right now very actively in the world. There's several uh, antibody treatments underway, but there's also an interest in moving to when people have it building, but they're still completely normal. And therefore they, um, they, you may have a better chance of preventing getting worse by removing the amyloid while the circuits are still not so injured. So um, this is just to give you a quick idea of some of the current drugs that are in development. Um, aducanumab, gantinumumab, lucanumab, donatumab, they're all, they're all MABs. Um, aducanumab is given, has been given a second chance. It was approved, sorry, 
but they have to they have to do another trial, so that's underway. Gantanumarab just reported that their findings did not show a convincing benefit, so that's not probably going to be continued. The Canamab is looking very promising. It's underway in uh, replication trials and also in people who are cognitively normal to prevent the onset of symptoms. And Donatamab is one. It's different than the other three because it acts right at the plaque itself and seems to remove amyloid very quickly. So what does this look like? So here's a normal person who doesn't have much in the way of amyloid uptake because this is actually uh, where you're seeing attachment to the, to the white matter. What's important is when it shows up in the cortex itself, shown here. This is in an MCI person here, um, and somebody with Alzheimer's disease where you can see there's a lot more of it. And it's showing color-coded and also just uh, in, in black and white. That's what people are looking for when they look for amyloid PET. And in the BEAM study, we're doing that in healthy controls, people with Lewy body disease, people with Alzheimer's disease, and people with small vessel disease, not FDD, because FDD, you don't expect to see it. And this is just showing that there is uptake. There's uptake in some patients with Lewy body disease as well as Alzheimer's disease. Also after, after stroke, uh, there was a study done in Hong Kong where they showed there was amyloid uptake in some of the patients who had stroke and they, if they had the amyloid uptake, they were more likely to decline because it meant that they had the pre-existing Alzheimer's disease as long with, as long with the stroke. Um, I'm not going to spend time because we're running out of time, um, but this is just to show uh, what the towel looks like. Uh, the towel looks like compared to the amyloid. It's got a little bit of a different distribution, um, showing it in you know, people with uh, at different stages. And now I want to talk about the brain amyloid memory study because that's really what we want to feature today. Uh, it's something we started a number of years ago because we thought it would be interesting not just to look at amyloid in AD and MCI patients, but also in people with Lewy body disease and a story, I'm just going to have to say, sorry, I'm giving a talk, I'll call you later. Um, the, um, uh, so we, we, were, we were fortunate because we banded together as the TDRA and, and we got some money from the Western Foundation Brain Canada grant. Uh, we had support, in-kind support from GE Healthcare, who was giving us the ligand. Um, eventually, um, sorry, the, the companies making these ligands have been less and less generous because, you know, they, there haven't been approved treatments and they haven't been approved to be, you know, used on a clinical basis. So they eventually withdrew, and, uh, but CAMH is doing it now um, with their psychotron and we're using something called Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Compound B, which is what GE Healthcare used as a comparator and it's used as a comparator for all of the antibodies because it's sort of the first way that we started measure amyloid in the brain back in about 2003-2004 and CAMH uh, provides that service to us as part of our team um, and we um, uh, we haven't got tau imaging yet but that may be something coming in the future. So we also our normal control population in this study was very important and we provided it to the Ontario Neurodegeneration Research Initiative because they didn't have any normal controls they were just doing people with different kinds of dementias and so this was a very important thing. And we also knew that of the 48, I think we had, or 44, only four people were positive. So they were truly not amyloid positive, but some were. And another study at another time, will tell you about what we're doing in a, in a new study for people who are cognitively normal, not at risk or at risk, which um, is um, something that uh, we hope to be, maybe we'll have a talk on this in six months when it's underway. So it's continuing thanks to some uh, philanthropy um, for us to be continuing this because we lost some of our partners. The objective is to look at ocular measures, which is we're measuring thickness in the eye of the retina because the retina is actually an extension of the brain. It's the, the eye is an extension of the brain and it may tell us what's going on in the brain. And there are even now some special cameras that can measure retinal amyloid. Uh, and that's a, pro a project we're also doing. But we also did, um, you know, the standardized imaging and the, the PET scans in Parkinson's and Lewy body disease and small vessel disease, which is much less uh, adequately studied. We think about 30% of Parkinson's patients will have amyloid in the brain, about 60% of Lewy body patients, and uh, small vessel disease, it's sort of not even clear. We're studying that. So Parkinson's and Lewy body disease is different because people have deficits of attention, executive function, visual spatial ability, more so than memory loss. They have fluctuating cognition and variation of attention and alertness. They have these recurrent visual hallucinations, which can be really devastating and very upsetting. 
they they don't sleep properly because they don't they don't they're not paralyzed when they're dreaming you're supposed to be paralyzed when you're dreaming and they move and have fragmented sleep and then they have some parkinsonism slowing of movement um, they have falls fainting autonomic dysfunction they can also have delusions um, these can actually Lewy body disease is you know, one of the most challenging of all of the conditions because it's people fluctuate and you have a normal thinking person one moment and somebody who's kind of disoriented and you know and, and, and believing very strange things. The abnormal protein in Lewy body Parkinson is synuclein, it's another misfolded protein. Um, and I just mentioned the percentages. So in the what we call optical coherence tomography, you've got all these retinal layers, just like you've got layers in the cortex. And what we're doing is we're going to look at these layers in relation to what's happening in people who are normal and patients with Alzheimer's disease, and maybe even in Parkinson's disease, you might see different patterns. I'm gonna rush through here because we're almost out of time for questions, but it's a, this is a complex um, study. And we, used, uh, we, we made it include exactly the same things that were being done in the Ontario Neurogenerative Research Initiative, because then we would be able to add the amyloid imaging to some of the same um, patients. They were, they were out of sequence though, to some extent. So the Andre first phase of Andre finished before being really got going. And then of course we had some loss of access to anything during the pandemic, but basically it involves neuropsych questionnaires, uh, neuropsych, neuropsychological testing questionnaires. Um, we have um, mood and behavior questionnaires. We do a thorough MRI, we do gait and balance, eye tracking, we do blood biomarkers, and we also do at Kensington Eye Institute, the, um, the uh, OCT, and then we do PET and M at, at CAMH. So um, we, I'm just going to finish by saying we need more patients. We've, um, we've, you know, we've, we can do the structural immune at all sites, but we do the amyloid PET. Originally, we did the phlebetabol at, at Sunnybrook or at CAMH, but now it's all CAMH for the, for the um, PIB PET. And this is sort of the numbers we're after. This is aspirational. We're recruiting from all the sites. This is just showing where we are today. Um, and this is what we still need. We've had to come down a little bit in our aspirations just because we're gonna run out of money, but it really is very novel. I don't know of any other project in the world that's doing all of this together as, as one study, including these interesting other biomarkers. And so we, uh, we really hope that we, we can see it through to enough numbers to really have meaningful, meaningful results. So in conclusion, neurodegeneration visible, what we call vasculopathy, that means uh, pathology of the vessels, visible vasculopathy biomarkers can be used in clinical practice. We do this all the time now with uh, MRIs done properly because we can see that white matter disease, we can see the size of the hippocampus. We can do with machine learning, we can take one of your scans, and in 90 seconds, we can give you the volume of the hippocampus. We can give you the volume of the ventricles. We can give you the volume of the brain and we give you the volume of the white matter disease. This is using machine learning techniques that we've developed at our lab and validated in various other uh, data sets from around the world. And it's downloadable and available. And basically uh, anybody can learn to do it. You don't have to be a brain imaging analyst. We've also included the E4 carrier status and sex because that's gonna be important. Um, and what's really, really important is that um, we are now in an era where we can measure in the blood whether or not you have Alzheimer's pathology. Very, very important. It's actually the tau that we measure best. Um, but we still don't know about these other conditions, and we're doing studies also in people with severe white matter disease. But remember, and there's all these trials are underway, they're going to be reading out next year, we might have effective treatments but they're selected for the people who are pretty clean and don't have a lot of white matter disease, for example. So I just wanted to end by saying, look, your lifestyle choices are very, very important. This is to the family members, to the patients living with uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's to the clinicians, everybody. Vascular risk, prote uh, risk protection and you know, um, prevention of vascular disease, that's like helping to manage diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, but also physical exercise, walking every day, 7,000 steps is protective, cognitive stimulation, Mediterranean diet, extraversion olive oil, vitamin D, everybody, and getting proper sleep, which is why sleep apnea must be recognized and treated. So I just wanted to mention that there is something called 10 of thumbs up, 
it's it's listed here and anybody who wants to participate it's an on it's an online intervention from CCMA which is trying to help people with vascular risk factors who are normal to um, basically do um, uh, kind of do better and it's a sort of a it's a supervised intervention program so I just want to acknowledge acknowledge financial support many trainers and colleagues and um, and that's it so um, I don't know if we have any time for questions